Everybody Hates Rand is a Wheel of Time podcast that will contain spoilers for all 14 books. So if you're anti-spoiler, stop this, read all 14 books, and come back. We'll be here, waiting. Our title is a joke and is meant to be taken as such. Everybody in this context refers to us and our cats. You are free to feel however you want about Rand. He's a fictional character. Please don't DM us. The world is a mess, dark one stretching out his hand. The dragon's reborn, the fire's been fanned, but everybody hates Rand. Everybody hates Rand. Everybody hates Rand. I don't actually really know what to say about this sort of sitcom-ish yeah, series I was, of chapters. I really was reading it, and I was like, this feels like a late season episode of Teen Wolf. Or Supernatural. Oh, Supernatural's better, you're right. Teen Wolf is a classier version. Yeah, it's about that level of dialogue, too, I would say. Yo, it's so bad, and apparently Talmanese is now some sort of, like, cartoon-esque jaw drops when he sees a woman-esque that figure. That was so offensive to me. I was like, Talmanese is Pride gay. Month? <laughs> <laughs> During Pride Month, Brandon? No, but, like, literally we've never seen Talmanese express any interest in women before, mm-hmm. and, like... Maybe it's not because it's qu- he's queer coded. Maybe it's just because he's a very polite person. Yeah, but like, but like either way, you have tanked a inter- integral integral part of his character. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that in these chapters. So this is everybody hates Rand. Everybody hates Matt in this yeah this chapter. It's rough. Um, your friendly neighborhood Wheel of Time podcast. I'm Emily Jushaw. and I'm Sally Goodger. And here we are to talk about. This episode of Supernatural, um, <laughs> Dean Winchester, played by Matt Cathan. Castiel isn't in this one, which means, which you know means it's going to be a lame one. Yeah, a bad one. Like, literally, I've watched all of Supernatural. That's something I'm both proud and ashamed of, because sure. I think it says a lot about both my sense of commitment and my sense of commitment. <laughs> <laughs> Um, both affectionate and derogatory. Yeah. Um, but it's like, literally, you'll be looking at IMDb and you'll be like, ugh, Castiel is not in even one. in this one. Why am I watching? God, it's gonna be boring. Better yeah. pull out Twitter while I'm in this one. So. Yeah, I guess Talmanese would be Sam. Yeah, Can he's I... kind of the like, I told you so. I did some actual research while you were gambling. Yeah, I'm the common sense Ex lawyer, Tibbled? Ex law student. Sam yeah, excuse me. Have a law excuse me. <laughs> he not... acts like he does. <laughs> he does have a bachelor's degree, I assume, which is more than Dean can yeah, say. Dean is illiterate. Dean might. I don't. <laughs> have we ever seen him read? Is there like a guns and ammo magazine? Yeah, probably. <laughs> he could be, he could be Busty reading. Beauties or whatever the fuck. Ew. <laughs> Busty Beauties. What Jolene. That <laughs> That's Jolene. 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 We haven't made a Jolene joke in quite a while. Um, Tibble's being insane, Tibble. and it's because we don't know why, but currently the only thing that soothes him as well as the thing that makes him crazy is our... is the giant tunnel. Yeah. What's it made out of? It's like a... Oh, it's such a weird fabric. It's, it's like, like a collapsible little tunnel. Yeah synthetic material yeah and it makes this like little rustling sound that he loves i i feel like i he is the frankenstein's monster that i've created because he was beating the shit out of ed on the weekend and ed is sickly right now so yeah like, it's like an alien it's like john keats <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is like little boy with glass bones disease right now so he can't exactly wrestle so i was like perhaps this will soothe your need for a stimulation um and he was like uh, no, now this is my emotional support tunnel. <laughs> yeah, it's like you come downstairs and you're like, where's Tibble? Surely he can't be in the tunnel, which has been flattened. Yeah. And then you like kind of get down on ground level and there his little eyes are peering at you. So he's lost his marbles, but did he ever have them? 
this is a total sidebar. It might go in the blooper reel, but I was reading this week about how Percy Shelley mm. predicted his own death by drowning um, because he didn't know how to swim and refused to learn, yet kept going out into the water. Didn't he die in a ship? He did. I think he died in some type of sailing accident or some other pretentious b- bullshit. It's like so on brand for one of the romantic poets to be like, if I die out there, I die, but I'm not learning how to swim. It'll be nice and tragic if I drown. I know. He's like, I'm fascinated by water. No one loves the ocean more than I do, but I refuse to learn even the basics of swimming. And it's like, bro, I didn't think anyone could get dumber than Lord, Lord Byron. Byron. Go die in the Greek Revolution. Yeah. Athens has a statue of Lord Byron, which is pretty funny to me. Yeah, we sort of made derogatory noises yeah. at it every time we <laughs> passed it. I hate you, Percy Shelley. God. So that's just your little romantic poet's sidebar they're, brought on by me thinking of John Keats ailing away. They are both like the most, they just like are the most insufferable group of men and yet they compel me so yeah, much. Coleridge, high as a kite. Just absolutely balls Keats to the wall. coughing blood. <laughs> that poor little critter. Yeah, and then Percy Shelley and Lord Byron and doing their absolute fuckboy shit. Yeah, and there was also William Blake who used to, like, dance naked in his garden or whatever. Oh my god. He was kind Just of a... As the spirit moved him? <laughs> yeah, he was kind of one of those dudes is my understanding. <laughs> That's probably my favorite of the weird (laughs) things. Like, just a little, just a weird little dude. A weird little guy. And there was Wordsworth taking his fucking walks. Yeah. Wordsworth. Loving, loving nature. Probably the most normal of them. Yeah, he's like, I'm just a guy who likes to walk around. William Blake is dancing naked in his yard, and George (laughs) George Gordon, Lord Byron, (laughs) is, like, sleeping with his sister (laughs) <laughs> Do you think Wordsworth got, like, invited to a lot of parties, <laughs> and then while he was there, they'd be like, you absolutely cannot tell the others about this. He'd be like, oh, where's, where's, where's Samuel? Yeah. Okay, so we didn't invite. <laughs> <laughs> so Sam, Sam Coleridge did not get an invite to this one. Yeah. Oh, um, not Percy either? Nope. No. Remember what he did last time? Swam in the fountain. Excuse me. Pretended to drown in the fountain. <laughs> God, uh, I hate them and I love them. Okay, well, actually, we have to talk about the bad chapters. Uh, I just, like, it's a really confusing, we'll get into it, but I just, like you said, it very much, in previous episodes, it very much feels like Brandon making a mountain out of a molehill. Oh, like with this, this, like, situation? Yeah, with this entire situation. Like, it didn't really need to be. Yeah, this this one is hard to, like, um, summarize in any particular plot order because it's it's so episodic. It's, like, this yeah. little event. Um, Matt and Talmanese and some of the other people go into this town called Hinderstep. They're told when they enter that they can stay for a couple of hours, but that they absolutely must be out before nightfall. Everyone kind of doesn't take this seriously. Matt does some gambling tricks in order to get this town to give him some food to resupply the army. Um, And when night falls, as it inevitably does, and everyone's still in town, all of the villagers in Hinderstap kind of are zombified. Like, they start killing each other. They start trying to kill anyone who's in their path. Just nonsensical violence. Um... Luckily, Matt and all the others escape um, and then return to the town where they find out that this has been happening for a few months now. Everyone going feral at night and then not remembering it in the morning and, in fact, waking up in their own beds, regardless of whether they've died or yeah, um, anything, you know, or, or were somewhere else entirely. Mm-hmm. Um, and Matt and everyone just kind of leave on that note and are like, oh, that's weird. weird. Yeah, the only other plot point of note is that there's a drawing of Matt being passed around because someone's looking for him. Yeah, there are actually two drawings of Matt and Perry being passed around, and Matt finds out about this in Hinderstap and is told that there's a town a little bit further along the road where someone is looking for them. That's the main thing. So, um, 
Yeah, it's, uh, I'm not gonna, like, go line by line, because most of it is just dialogue, and as we've referenced, most of the dialogue is pretty silly. Yeah. Um, it's not dialogue that particularly advances the plot, or particularly advances our understanding of any of the characters, um, which is not always necessary, you know, it's perfectly reasonable to have kind of, like, rest periods or slices of life. Yeah. In a way, with characters um but when we're working with characters who have been so much changed by the author shift Mm -hmm. it is grating rather than comforting yeah Uh, at least to us so um yeah to your point which i guess is to my point that i made a couple (laughs) episodes ago the whole Hinderstap episode is not terribly necessary in terms of the plot. Mm-hmm. Like, spoiler alert, this this drawing that's being passed around of Matt is going to lead Matt to Varen, mm. who has some information for him and will get them to Camelin faster. That is, I would say, plot relevant. But you could get to Varen in other ways. Obviously, Matt could have, you know, they could have had a, an uneventful supply stop and just found this Still out. seen it, yeah. Or they could have sort of stumbled on Vir- Varen because Matt is to Viren. Yeah. And that makes total sense. Yep. Um, Hinderstap will come back in the last battle where Matt will use the sort of unkillable quality of these people as like um, a, a sort of force in his army. It's a little weird, but um, that's supposed to be our kind of like the prestige. Matt Matt remembered Hinderstap and went back and got those people to help fight in the last battle because everyone's fighting in the last battle. Sure. So it does come back, but it's in a way that doesn't need to come back. It's not terribly necessary yeah. that they be there in the last battle. So, um, not necessary. So, what's the point of this episode becomes the question. Yeah. And I can't think of one. <laughs> yeah, um, I was trying to think of that too because as we've we've said before, um, this book has been like it's a very like uh, steep curve in the amount of uh, bubbles of evil we've been getting. We've been pretty much plodding along um, for the last couple of books with like a steady increase, and this one has just like really like exponentially increased. We seem to get one. Almost every set of chapters that we've read so far, we seem to get one in some form or another, which is, again, a kind of like nice um, mechanic if it was being used a bit more. To me, it doesn't necessarily feel strategic. It feels like um, we're just kind of using it for flavor at this point. Like it's almost a way to sort of get between incidents. Yeah, like oh, I need to have something happen in this chapter besides people just talking to each other. Yeah. So cockroaches in the tent, it is. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't really understand. This is one of the most, like, extended sequences of a bubble of evil. Um, or Tom calls it a snag in the pattern. Maybe that's different. I don't know. Um, it's one of the most extended sequences that we've got. Um, like, the longest in terms of page length. Um, except for maybe that town where everyone is seeing ghosts or whatever. What's that town called? Perrin was there. Oh, the one where Perrin goes for yeah. a resupply. Yeah, that was a couple chapters too, but also not like action packed. Yeah, and this one is very like, it's an action sequence. We're fighting the whole time. It's very disturbing. Um, there are like children fighting in the streets, um, sort of blood crazed. So, um, like... I guess mechanically one function could be to make those stakes feel even higher, like the bubbles of evil, quote, unquote, whatever they are, um, are getting more intense. The Dark One is having more of a presence. Um, I just, again, I don't feel like this was necessary to convey that to me. I feel like I've been feeling that for the last couple of books. Um... Yeah, it doesn't make sense tonally either. Yeah. There's some real wild tonal shifts in this. Like you said, it's a very disturbing sequence. Yeah. And I do want to say, like, as a 
bubble of evil or as like background flavor if this was somehow more relevant to the plot or if something relevant to the plot was happening in tandem i think hinderstab would be a very interesting yeah like event as you said it's tom kind of distinguishes it from a bubble of evil by calling it a snag in the pattern presumably referring to the sort of like reset yeah like of like time happening yeah um uh, that's interesting it is incredibly troubling and disturbing but matt does not handle it as though it is disturbing or troubling yeah or rather he does in like little these little bursts of moments where he's like oh this is horrendous but then he kind of goes right back to joking mm-hmm. you know and like popping off with these silly little one-liners with that are sort of overloaded with wheel of time swear words yeah in really grating ways so um yeah like it's sort of i sort of put it in contrast to the last major bubble of evil i guess i would say that matt interacted with when we saw that like town that sunk into the earth yes um which was handled both to be plot relevant because it was in the path Mm -hmm. of um the carnival at that time the circus excuse me um and it led to like more conversation about leaving the circus sort of prepped us for that um happening um it was relevant in people's characters we got to see how shanshan reacted to that we got to see how common folk react to that as opposed to matt who's kind of used to it yeah Matt himself was terribly disturbed by that, and, like, it was something he had a hard time yeah, getting past, in a way. He wasn't as scared of it as the circus goers were, but sure. it, like, psyched him out. Yeah. Um, so that, I would say, was handled pretty well. It was very spooky. It was very disturbing. And here we just have kind of, like we've said, a supernatural episode where it's, like, gory but not scary, um there's this sort of horrifying setup but because of the tone of the characters it's not actually horrifying yeah we don't lean into any of the elements that make horror a compelling genre yeah obviously you can have funny horror but um you need to do it a little more light-handedly i would say than is done with matt's jokes in this series of chapters Yeah, and we keep referring to this as, like, a supernatural setup because it has that sort of monster of the week vibe where it's, like, a group of people that we're following enter a place that is unfamiliar to them. They encounter a sort of supernatural thing that they have to fight. And then perhaps what is really lacking from this is that, like, there's no resolution. Like, in every monster of the week type episode the monster is killed or the curse is broken or something happens, even if as in things like Supernatural and Teen Wolf, there's that sort of overarching season plot in every episode, you have some type of resolution, which is part of what makes like monster of the week type stories really satisfying. It's like, yes, we have set out to do a thing and we do that thing. Yeah, it's a vignette that is resolved within itself, which like a lot of people have said of Supernatural specifically that the Monster of the Week episodes in the early seasons are some of the strongest. Yes. And that's totally true. Like, it is nice to take a step back from the overarching plot occasionally, as long as you are doing something compelling with this miniature episode. I think also the supernatural vibes come from this being, like, a town in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. The guys in Supernatural are often traveling to small towns in middle America Mm -hmm. and dealing with spooky things there. This is a very, like, isolated setup. It's affecting the whole town. Yeah. Um, The only thing missing is, like, a hot blonde to fall in love with Dean. Yeah, and ultimately die tragically or something. Yeah, ultimately get fridged. Um... But I think what might redeem, not to constantly play in the space of, like, how would we do this differently, but I think what might be missing from Hinderstap or what might make it feel functional is if, like, Matt and company learn something significant about how the bubbles of evil are operating beyond just the fact that they are really random. Like, if we're pairing these, like, random bubbles of evil against Matt's random luck powers, what could potentially happen? That might have been interesting and tied into what Matt is doing perhaps more significantly than like bringing back a town of people that are under some sort of terrible 
curse type thing as his sort of trick instead of getting yeah. like getting like a piece of information about how these are functioning or like something yeah like you bring up something interesting about matt's sort of trickster prowess which is that one of the other mechanics going on in these chapters um is that matt is gambling for the opportunity to even buy food mm-hmm. um and he does that first by losing intentionally sort of what what is good for him is losing initially you know winning a couple of times but basically getting other people confident Mm -hmm. um and then he manages to like use his luck powers when someone else is tossing the dice yeah and so that's sort of meant to be like look at how his powers are expanding but i agree with you it would be far more interesting if matt was using any sort of like trickster his trickster nature his luck powers to actually gain something from this plot besides food. Yeah. Um, and, like, using his luck powers in a setup that did not involve money, mm-hmm. I think would be a far more interesting step for him than um, just going back and back to this gambling in taverns scene that we're constantly in. Yeah. Like, it would be so much more interesting if we got to see Matt trick the Dark One in yeah. an interesting way. Yeah. Sort of in preparation for us going to the Tower of Genji, where we'll also see his sort of trickster powers. Yeah, especially because, like, this scene has that framework of the dice in his head rolling. Like, it starts rolling when he enters Hinderstep, and it stops rolling when night falls. When he decides to stay. Yeah, when he decides to stay. And it's like, okay, Brandon, but, like, why? Like, I don't understand in this particular instance why the dice, like, it's not like he really got anything out of it except being like, well, that fucking sucked. Yeah, the dice roll as a mechanic for showing us that something is important to the narrative and the plot. And this, as we have just said at length, is not. Is not. So, um... I also think it could have been interesting if this had any sort of tragic consequences beyond just, like, having to leave this village here, which clearly Matt doesn't feel too terrible about. Yeah. Like, if, say, I don't know, what would happen if Tom died in Hinderstep and then joined the village? Yeah, and had to stay there. That, I think, is a really interesting Hinderstep mechanic. Like, if somebody dies there, dies they, there they get, get incorporated. caught up in the, the loop. So, like, then you would have to fix the loop in order for Tom to get into the Tower of Genji. Or, like, what if it's Talmanese? Then do you just have to decide, we're leaving Talmanese here? Yeah. Like, it would be interesting if you actually had to make hard decisions or do anything beyond just saying, like, okay, well, sucks for you guys. Yeah. We're taking all your food now. Yeah, I mean, it literally is almost exactly the same plot that Perrin encountered in that other town whose name I'm totally blanking on. Nothing. But all he did was come in to a town of people who are suffering both, like, very intense psychological consequences of this, like, horrifying bubble of evil around them steal their food and then refuse to leave an Aes Sedai there with them to help although the Hinderstab town did refuse that so whatever and then just be like well too bad yeah so it's just kind of a repeat plot is my other problem like with Perrin's plot um we in that episode talked a lot about like what does it mean to like leave the small people behind in the in the course of the apocalypse or in the course of a plot and like how do you wrestle with the decisions of like who gets food when there's a famine going on and stuff and we've already the narrative didn't necessarily wrestle with it but if you're like the type of reader who's thinking about that stuff then you already have And by this point in the series, we've all pretty much settled into the space of, like, everything that's happening around our main characters is, like, irrelevant. Like, we're not obligated. It's not a a series that asks us to care about whether or not people are starving off screen. Yeah, exactly. So why why are we just doing it again? Is my beef, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, so kind of swing and a miss for me, personally here in Hinderstap, and not only because Matt is just horrific to read in these chapters in particular. I mean, I know everyone knows this already, but it can't be overstated that he is insufferable. Yeah. And, like, even 
it is like every character. Like, it's it's in Matt's plot. Like, it's leaking out from Matt into Talmanese in a really rancid way. It's leaking out into Tom, who's suddenly just, like... Spouting the weirdest metaphors. Yeah. I'm, He's like, I'm doing my best to do, like, an Ian McKellen impression in Lord of the Rings. Yeah. By doing, like, these convoluted metaphors that no one would say in their real life. Yeah. Where was the one? I feel old these days, Matt, like a faded rug, hung out to dry in the wind, hinting of the colors it once showed so vibrantly. Who says that? Yeah, that's like a a, a thing for internal narration. People don't speak that way. Yeah, you just say, man, I feel old. It's like a rug. Fuck, I feel old. Yeah. I don't know, maybe some people speak that way, but they're not fun to be around. Yeah, and Tom, for all his faults, is kind of fun to be around. Yeah, he's kind of, he's that, like, silly old guy. He's just, like, a weirdo. He's just that weird old man that's in my crew. And, like, Tom has, like, four lines that are just like that. So yeah. So, that's what we're talking about. Speaking of Tom, like, these two chapters are bracketed by Tom conversations, Matt and Tom conversations. In the first one, we just have Matt and Tom weirdly, like, reminiscing about the good old days. Yeah. The only interesting thing about that, I think, I mean, it's not interesting, it's another missed opportunity, is that Matt is like, oh yeah, I don't really remember that. And yeah. Tom isn't like, oh, worm? Yeah, what? Tell me more about your memory problems. Because Matt has pretty much skated by with not letting people know how little memory he has. Yeah. Up until this point, we've never had him to see him, like, confront the reality of that with anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because we haven't had him, like, meet up with his family and be like... Oh, I don't, I don't recognize you know? my dad, you know. <laughs> or, like, like, have Bode be like, oh, remember that time with mom? And him have to be like, no. no. She'll be like, it was three years ago. And he's like, like, I know, I just don't remember. Yeah. And that's something that I would be interested in seeing Matt confront. And, like, if I was gonna let anyone on the secret, in on the secret of his dead people's memories it would definitely be tom yeah that's the especially as you go towards the tower of genji plot where you will meet your arch nemeses again yeah the eelfin and the eelfin i mean um and then at the end they have this sort of conversation where tom is like where matt is like God, it sucks that the Dark One keeps hunting me, and this is all about me, and yeah, it's just never going to stop. And I'm like, this is such a weird conversation to be having in book 12. Mm-hmm. Like, what? Yeah, I, it also, not to like keep berating the point, but it feels really just like out of character for Matt to say that to somebody. Like, um. Yeah, to be like, complaining. I mean, Matt, I think one of the interesting things about him was such a, like, crybaby in the early books. Yeah. He was whining constantly. And pretty much after book three, he keeps it to himself. Yeah, like, again, it's one of those things that he might say internally, but to, like, say to another person, oh, I, it basically in the format of, like, a therapy session, like, oh, I have come to the realization that this thing I've been avoiding confronting directly is a truth I can no longer avoid. Yeah, he doesn't really... He he still complains, I would say, about small things. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's generally not really talking about his place in the plot. The example that comes to mind is um, right after he left Ebu Dar and was really kind of hung up on his role in the Sea Folk uprising, mm-hmm. how he first let some of the sea folk loose and then that led to a lot of escapes but also a lot of deaths and blah 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 blah. we saw him really like thinking about that and um struggling with it in a way but we did not see him talking about it to anyone yeah um so yeah there's some disparities there there's just so much misogyny like this this series this um, episode opens with Matt being like, bloody women, they don't make anything easy. And then it's just these little asides every single time. Tom, in the vein of his insane story about how that one time he tried to wes- rescue a woman from- rescue a woman? Rescue a woman? <laughs> rescue a woman from her abusive husband, but she didn't want to be rescued. Remember that? 
It's way back in like <laughs> books. <laughs> I don't think I do. It's insane. It's after Matt is. Uh, it's because I just read it in Lord oh, of Chaos. Yeah. It's when Matt is like, I wish Egg and everyone would just let me. Oh, help them. Oh yeah, and he's like, sometimes you just can't help them. Yeah, it like is almost a feminist statement where he's like, have you considered just doing like helping them the way they want to be helped? Yeah. But then he also has to have this insane story about this woman who was lying about being abused or who really liked it secretly. Yeah. Anyway, Tom says, lies never make things easier in the long run unless they're to exactly the right person, usually a woman, at exactly the right time. Like, guys? Guys? Yeah, and the, like, scene with Talmanis that I mentioned at the beginning is so egregious. Like, the Aes Sedai are bathing when shit goes down in Hinderstep. So they have to go get them, so all of them are, like, in their bathrobe or, like, hastily dressed, and Jolene's robe isn't, like, fully crossing her yeah, chest. Yeah, it's like Teslin and Edesina, the not hot ones, yeah. are dressed hastily, but of course Jolene's was the dress that they used to tie up some people, and so she's in a bathrobe that's a little bit open. Yeah. How sexy. Yeah. And it's like, it's not really, bathrobes aren't, it's a bathrobe. I assume it's yeah. not like a silk yeah, I kimono. S- <laughs> <laughs> it's not like a lingerie robe. <laughs> it's like a probably like a terry cloth. It's like robe. a grandma robe, I imagine. But it's just like showing a little bit of titty. A little bit of cleavage. And Talmanis is like Talmanis whistles, which is insane. Yeah. Like, are you even joking? First of all, Talmanis would never he like like, I feel like no Kyrianen would. Like, it's a yeah. cultural thing almost beyond being, like, a character thing. Yeah, the, Ky- the Kyrianen are, like, famously repressed, except on festival days yeah, when where they'll make, make out, out in the street. everyone. And also, like, he would not do that because he has a sense of self-preservation. Yeah, Jolene should have whooped his ass. Yeah. And also, he's polite. Yeah. He was, like, a nice guy. Not in a, like, nice guy derogatory way, but in, like, being a genuinely pleasant person most of the time. Yeah, we've seen him interact with Aes Sedai before. He was at that hilarious meeting with Egg. I guess we, as in we and you, the audience, weren't there because yeah. that was in Path of Dagger. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but it's a good scene when he's just, like, chilling. But that is the only good scene in Path of Dagger yeah. when Egg goes to a meeting in an ice field and Talmanese is there, there leaning sexily on a yeah. tent pole. Yeah. Um, so it's just, like, so silly, and Matt has to be, like, she's an Aes Sedai, not a woman, basically. Um. I'm like, what is this rhetoric? It was so tired. Like. Six books ago. Yeah, and then Talmanese has to, like, pick his jaw up off the floor, like a fucking Family Guy character. Yeah. It's so rancid. God. So I don't, I don't, (laughs) I don't know why Brandon really picked up misogyny and was like as we talked about last time emily and the good point that like most of wheel of time humor is misogyny based so he's trying to be like it's so funny but it's like brando or maybe robert jordan wrote this in Tommy's just had a big character arc change in i think we can book. safely say that robert jordan didn't write this and i'm not saying that because robert jordan is such a better writer than brandon they're different there's not a qualitative difference yeah. um but this obviously does not read like Robert Jordan. The misogynistic jokes would be different. If they yeah, they'd be, just Jordan. have a little diff- different flavor. A little different. Matt would certainly not sound like this. Yeah. Like this sort of backwards hick who doesn't know anything. Like, it's almost like Ra- Brandon Sanderson is writing him with like this sort of like country boy accent. <laughs> I can't get past- it's like the constant swearing. (laughs) Matt says when they go back to the town, they're like, come on, we'll get you some tea. Matt says, I'm not going anywhere with you, spirit. And I read that as, I'm not going anywhere with you, spirit. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. It's got like the letter Kenny fucking accent. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man, you guys. Also, like, we- this is really nitpicky, but like, we have not been told that like, spirits are a thing in Wheel of Time. I've not seen ghosts Land. before, but, like, they have not interacted with him yeah. in that way. So. So. I don't really know what's going on here. Yeah. I apologize for my mistake of having us to do three chapters last time and these two chapters this time because there's nothing more to say. And we still have some time, but I guess it'll be a short one. Because, you guys, what else is there to say? Hinderstep was silly. 
Interstep had potential, like a lot of things. Yeah. But it was misused horribly. Yeah. There's also some egregious typos in this chapter. Oh, really? I didn't notice because I can't read. <laughs> well, no, I uh, should say it's because I'm a copy editor by trade. Yeah. So, um, noticed a couple of those. That was pretty wild. What must it be like to have a book published? Every time I see a typo in a published book, I'm always like, how? I know. I guess with, like, a book this big... How could there not be, you yeah, know? fair. But I'm also like, we haven't seen a lot of typos in the earlier Wheel of Time books, so it does feel like these ones were, in some sense, rushed. Yeah. Which I think explains a lot of that. I think the books 1 through 11 suffered from having little to no editorial oversight, and books 12 through 14 suffered from a perhaps egregious amount of editorial oversight as people were trying and there were a few too many cooks in the kitchen yeah but that is uh speculation perhaps yeah we'll never know unless they drop the documentary harriet dropped God, the lost can footage you imagine a documentary about the writing of the wheel of time It'd be wild it would be so boring <laughs> I think it'd be kind of interesting. <laughs> I'm very interested in the project of picking up another writer's work after they die. Yeah. I think that's, like, conceptually very interesting to me. I agree. I think that part is interesting, but I think it's so difficult because Brandon Sanderson, because he's a polite person, will never tell us what he really thought yeah. <laughs> about the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. He's never going to be like, it's, I think he has in the past been like, Wheel of Time was hardest to write and I did not enjoy writing it. Yeah, I believe it. Which is Brando. like, thank you for that honesty, but he's never going to be like, it sucked because Robert Jordan wrote an impossible series of books with so many loose ends that it just was never going to be good. Yeah, and uh, I mean, also just the misogyny and yeah, the fascism and... It's all bad. Okay, guys, so next on the docket, um, first of all, we are more than halfway through. Thank fuck. Yeehaw. Yeehaw, indeed. But when you turn the page from the Hinderstrap chapters, you get a map of the capital city of Eridoman, Bandar Ebon, which just sounds insane that these two. Eridoman. Sounds like the letters were just scrambled yeah. a little bit. Um, so the promised, long-awaited <laughs> Eridomon section can finally begin. Let's get to the war crimes. Oh, let's not. Well, they're coming whether we like it or not. Aw, oh, dang it. Ah, oh, shoot. Ah, oh, dang it. Ah, oh, beans. I ain't going anywhere with oh, you, Ah, blood and bloody ashes. I ain't going anywhere with you. I ain't going anywhere with you, spirit. Okay. <sighs> so... <laughs> Hey, next week is our 250th episode of Everybody Hates Rand. Yeah, how about that? Yeah. How about that? How about that? Maybe we just will celebrate by not reading Wheel of Time, <laughs> and we'll just talk about whatever we want to talk about. Uh, we haven't watched any good um, we could shows just, recently. We could just drop our Hunger Games analysis in oh, the middle. Oh, yeah. We've been re-watching... <laughs> We're watching for the first time, in my case, the yeah, Hunger, Hunger Games, Games movies. movies. Yeah, we should. And that'd be pretty funny. <laughs> Episode 250. <laughs> it's not about Wheel of Time. We just skip these chapters entirely. <laughs> same as um, Path of Daggers. Yeah, same with Path of Daggers. We're just like, no. Um, so maybe we'll do something fun. Um, if we can think of anything, maybe we'll just continue business as usual. To be determined. But either way, I think you should do something to celebrate. Yeah. Bake yourself a cake. Oh, yeah. That sounds lovely. Make yeah. yourself a really tasty cake. Or Ooh. buy yourself a really tasty cake if you're not about that baking life. As the case may be. Yes. So, thanks to um, all of you. Thanks to Glenna McKenzie for our theme song. Thanks yeah. to our patrons on Patreon and our followers on social media. Yeah, you guys are the best. Yeah. Um, lots of exciting content popping off on the Patreon these days. Um... So go check it out if you're interested. If not, uh, don't have to support monetarily. Just listening is lovely. Yeah. Do you have a sign off? 
Um, sure. This isn't, this is maybe not the cream of the crop, but, um, I am on a allergy medication that comes, it's just like a very weird format. It's like a liquid medication that comes in like little individual doses. Um, and I can only pick up like 90 day supplies at a time because probably when I pick them up, they come in these enormous boxes and the pharmacist has to give me like a grocery sized paper bag to carry them home in and it like shouldn't be because it doesn't matter what medication I'm on but I always feel so silly walking out of the pharmacy with just like the biggest bag like I have to carry it like I'm a character in a sitcom carrying their <laughs> groceries around just like walking around but instead of like apples and lettuce yeah. coming out at the top it's just it's just my medication so I had to do that today and like everyone around me was picking up their like petite and dainty medications mm-hmm. and I roll out with the big boy the big boy and they're all I, I'm just in my head I'm like they must all be thinking what the fuck is wrong with that bitch <laughs> Oh, God. Oh, God. She's like six. six. Whatever's wrong with her. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not her. Yikes. It's just bad medicine, okay? Yeah. It's just, I mean, it the could, medicine is fine. The I medicine guess. is fine. It just could maybe come in a more useful format. Yeah. Have you heard of pills? <laughs> no. These people are like, never. No. We're innovating. We're innovating. And said you have to carry around eight bottles of liquid every single day. Yeah. It's true. Every day in Greece, Sally had to pull out her little, little liquid. I know, and then I'd be making, it's like making a little potion. <laughs> it makes yeah. a silly little sound. It does sort of like look like you're milking a cow with only one udder. <laughs> My cows! <laughs> it's like, whoop! Yeah, it makes a silly little plopping noise. Okay, oh, everyone. Now you know. <laughs> Bye! Goodbye!